Okay, I'm impatient. Let's get started. Uh, I'm very excited that anybody else that needs to log on can continue to join in. Um, I wanna welcome you all to, uh, this is the Friends of Holland Hills uh, educational series, a continuation of our uh, discussion of architecture. That's why you're, you're seeing my face here. Um, and I just wanted to, for those of you who don't know exactly who we are, the Friends of Holland Hills is a 501c3 formed by members of the community um, so that we could um, allow um, donations to be made to the community um, as a 501c3, a nonprofit, um, uh, to allow us to do things in the neighborhood. We had a lot of interest in folks that wanted to be able to, to figure out a way to, uh, to contribute to Holland Hills. And so that's what we've done. Um, and we focus on one of our one of our um, areas of focus is education and, and doing things to sort of bring to the forefront, not just Holland Hills, but mid-century modern architecture and design. And, uh, and that's sort of the series we're in today. And today we're going to be talking about architecture and Frank Lloyd Wright. I'm very pleased to welcome Peter Keene, who is a guide at Pope Leahy House. Um, if you're not local, the Pope Leahy House is a Frank Lloyd Wright structure that is um, local to us here in Virginia. We also have Bill Christensen, who is a lecturer at the Smithsonian on the subject of Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, previous architecture sessions uh, were, were really a lot, a lot of conversations with myself and other architects, but uh, as Christine and I were preparing for this seminar with Bill and Peter, um, I was so captivated by the depth of their knowledge that uh, I'm going to refrain from talking and allow Bill and Peter to do um, what they do best. Um, allow me to change the screen over to our uh, presentation and, and we will get started. Just a moment. Without further ado, Bill Christensen, I'm sorry, Bill Keene and Peter Christensen. Thank you very much for coming. Hey, John, we need to go back to a couple slides. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, what you see here is Frank Lloyd Wright with a, a model of what he termed Broad Acre City. It developed over a period of years in the 1930s. It was his concept for sort of an ideal suburb, not so much an ideal city, but an ideal suburb. Uh, it had transportation to bigger cities. It had farms. It had agricultural land in addition to that for raising uh, raising animals. It had small factories, and it had nodes in addition to a variety of housing styles. Wright felt that the gasoline station was integral to the development of cities in the 1930s and beyond. And he didn't hesitate to take credit in the post-World War II era for having invented the suburb. So, another thing about Wright that you often hear about is you hear about his most famous buildings. And recently, eight of them were just inducted into the UNESCO um, World Heritage Hall of Fame. And two of the most famous ones that I'm sure you all heard of, Falling Water and the Guggenheim Museum, you don't necessarily, well, the Guggenheim may be more, but Falling Water, there's an interesting mix between traditional architecture and modern architecture. And Wright is an amazing bridge for that and bringing that together. But one of the concepts that Wright plays with a lot is this idea of organic architecture and how the, the buildings become part of their location. And we see this as in Wright's development and we really love the way that it flows into the way Holland Hills is built. So there's an interesting mix and, and natural connection between all of these buildings. I think Falling Water, perhaps better than any other of Wright's work, shows his concern about blending in with the natural environment. It is a building that looks like it belongs exactly where it is. And as Peter was saying, many of the homes in Holland Hills, with the concern about the natural topography, the trees and plants that were there, and minimizing the intrusion on those, shows that concept. Now, let's go to the next slide, John. So here we have the classic prairie style building, right? Um, the Roby House in Chicago, um, really typifying all the early styles he had. But you can see the 
the beginning of really modern architecture in this whole design. Yeah, with the prairie style, he simplified the silhouette of the house. He made it blend more with the flat lines of the prairie, horizontal bands of windows, very uh, you know shallow pitched roofs, simplified silhouette with only one or two chimneys. And it's a very different concept from what was going on before in the Queen Anne and Victorian styles. Let's go to the next slide, John. And in 1909, Wright summarized this work that he was doing in the Prairie style and published a portfolio of his work in Germany, the Wasmuth Portfolio, um, which really brought his, his, his name to attention to a lot of European architects who really weren't familiar with what was going on in the United States. But it really was an amazing type of expression and it had an amazing impact. And one of the uh, first recipients of this portfolio is a small atelier in Berlin run by an architect named Peter Berens. And on Berens' staff at the time was Le Corbusier, Mies van der Rohe, and Walter Gropius. And the story goes is that on the day that that portfolio arrived, they clearly did nothing else but just go through that portfolio and were amazed. And then you see ev evidence of the impact. This um, Drawing of rights, there's a building he built in um, Mason City, Iowa, the uh, hotel and um, bank complex. And then you see the drawing of the building that Gropius built in Cologne, clearly being influenced by those designs. And the work that they were doing changed beyond that. Uh, the following year, it was published in book form, so it wasn't as expensive and made an even bigger impact because architects who weren't in an office like uh, with Peter Behrens could afford to buy a copy, and it also had photographs in it. So it was in Europe, really, that Wright made a big impact before he made an impact in the U.S. And you can see his one and only hotel in the upper right of the screen. It is still a hotel, it's in operation at the far end of that block was a bank, which is now part of the hotel and the banking floor itself has been turned into their ballroom. And you can see the similarity between the, the photograph at the, at the bottom of the screen in terms of how his architecture was impacting architects in Europe. Then you know, a number of years, Wright was not particularly active, but um, when he came back from Europe, he had some problems getting commissions. And in the early 1930s, one of the really interesting things that happened was that young Philip Johnson had just graduated from Harvard and hooked up with um, Russell Hiscock, and they became the curators of architecture at the Museum of Modern Art and developed this portfolio, this exhibit, of Modern Architecture. Um, interesting, at first, Johnson kind of dismissed Wright and thought of him as a precursor. Um, one of his more interesting slams on Wright is in the 1930s, he's describing Wright as the greatest architect of the 19th century. Um, but with some emphasis from the Bauhaus people, um, Johnson and Hitchcock were convinced to include Wright in this portfolio. And Wright was one of the four featured architects in the uh, in the exhibit, and it uh, not only was at MoMA, but it traveled around the country to, I believe, a dozen different cities, uh, including as far west as San Francisco and Los Angeles. So that really began to introduce modern architecture to the more general public in the U.S. Of course, even before this was happening, one of the things that Wright did just before World War I, and that's the next slide, John, is um, he developed a concept of inexpensive homes that were um, essentially built off-site and prefabbed. And Bill knows a little bit more about this than I do, but it's a really fascinating issue. And the idea that this house on, the, on your right is over 100 years old is just kind of mind-boggling. The, the picture on the right is a picture that I took in 2015. Uh, it had just been discovered that this was one of the American system-built houses. 
Uh, it was previously unknown that it was that it was there. So this is the way it looked in 2015. It has just been repainted. The window treatment is basically the same, but it's been repainted in more of a right, frankly, right palette with a sort of sand color and darker trim. What the American system built was a significant part of Wright's life at the time. It could have been a game changer. There are more than 900 drawings in the archives that Wright did and his apprentices did dealing with the American system build. It wasn't, it was sort of a halfway point to prefabrication. The idea is that the wood trim, the windows, the doors, the cabinetry and so forth would all be pre-cut and available through distribution system. Distribution system was in place and being strengthened when World War I broke out, there were distribution areas in about five states centered on Illinois. And you have to ask the question, what would have happened if that had been a success? The idea was a, a, a challenger to the Sears kit houses. If that had been a success, you know, would we have falling water in the Guggenheim and so forth? Would Wright's career have gone in a very different direction? There are two-story, one-story, uh, multiple, almost apartment buildings. There were a number of different combinations that you could get. Uh, so it was something very important to write and could have been a game changer. There was a, a subdivision started in 1917 to be built in Chicago of 50 houses. Only two were actually built. And then, of course, the war shut down. The materials were no longer available. But it could have been something very different in Wright's career. And John, the next slide, we go back to Broadacre City and that those first Houstonians. Um, the, the whole idea that, uh, and the, the name Broadacre City is that everybody's got a good sized piece of land um, so that they can feel like they're living in a natural environment. But he's exploring these in, initial smaller affordable homes that he want, wants to build that he calls Houstonian homes. And that's where really, that's where I come in with the, the Pope Leahy house. Um, but Really, a really interesting ex exploration. Uh. Peter, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is Christine. Uh, we've gotten a lot of uh, comments that people are having difficulty hearing your audio. Um, so I don't know if maybe you could lean a little bit closer to your microphone or something. In the mic, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully that'll work a little better. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bill, you want to continue with the Broadacre? Okay, the Broadacre uh, I mentioned right was in our very first slide, shown with the model in a vertical position. The model was built by the apprentices for the exhibit in uh, Rockefeller Center, is where it premiered in New York City. Uh, Edgar Kaufman, who uh, later was the client for Falling Water, gave a thousand dollars to help finance the uh, the project. It was 12 feet on a side, so 144 square feet altogether. And what you see here is not uh, is part of that traveling exhibit, but it evolved over the next three decades. And in the last book that Wright published called The Living City, it looks quite a bit like this, but it has changed. There are even some high rise buildings in it and so forth, but it was this total concept for a city that he referred to in a publication in 1932 as the disappearing city. And he posited the reasons why the city in the future would really look very different. The automobile, telecommunications, and that's with an S. TV had just been barely introduced at the World's Fair. Uh, Herbert Hoover was the first president to actually appear on television. So Wright picked up on the idea that that would become something in the future. Again, the automobile would be the key. The gasoline station would be a node around which shops and so forth would, would coalesce. Uh, the idea of the car gave you freedom to move around in Broadacre City. You weren't tied to just a small downtown area. So all of this came about and coalesced, but didn't change greatly from 1934, 35, 36, when the model finally came out to 1958. And as a result of this exploration, in the next slide, we see the first house that was built on this Usonian concept. This is the Jacobs House in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, 1,500 square feet, uh, open space plan, 
uh, slab floor construction, radiant floor heating, and lots of glass windows to connect the people into the world around them. One of the real keys is making it feel like you're living in a very natural environment. And this house from the street looks very different. There's just a small band of clerestory windows on the street side, and yet on the living room side, you have 11 feet floor-to-ceiling windows, an entire wall of windows. Windows next to that that go about waist height is the dining room and then the bedroom wing, so it's an L-shaped plan. And this also is one of the eight buildings listed now in the World Heritage List. And then the next slide is, is the uh, Pope Leahy House that's um, only about five miles away from Holland Hills, now located on, on Woodlawn Plantation. And it's much like the, the Jacobs House. Um, on one side, the public side, there are very few windows. On the private side, which is being protected by the L shape, it's just almost all windows. And it's opening the house up and connecting the people and making them feel like they're living in this natural environment. I just saw a, uh, a question about someone saw the model at, uh, uh, in, uh, just a few years ago. The, mo the archives were moved from Taliesin in, West, uh, in Arizona to New York City, shared by MoMA and the Avery Architecture Library at Columbia. Columbia has all the paper and film documents, the models of, of uh, Falling Water, Broadacre City, the uh, Guggenheim, et cetera, are at MoMA. Okay, then let's go on to the next slide. And this is you know, another planned community that Wright was developing. Again, Bill knows more about this than I do, but. Uh, well, Wright in, the, in 1947 did two small communities for scientists at uh, Upjohn Pharmaceuticals. This is the last plan that he did because Parkwin was within the city limits of Kalamazoo, Michigan. They, his original plan was for circular lots but they insisted that he redo it uh, in this manner. And the names that you see, uh, Brown, Levin, et cetera, were for actual houses that he designed within the community. In the uh, other community nearby, it was outside the city limits, so they had uh, circular lots. In both cases, the scientists went together and bought as a group, bought the land. And uh, uh, this is, uh, emblematic of things that Wright had been working on, World War II housing and going back further. And it comes out again of the Broadacre City concept of how you might plan a small community. One of the things that I particularly like about this plan is the relationship of the get, getting away from the grid pattern that standard developers so often want to go to. And it's one of the wonderful things about Holland Hills is that you're not on that grid plan and you have the circular drives and the Things are meandering a little bit, and they're much more interesting by, by doing it this way. Yeah, and a you know a, a common area in the center, and uh, the other community only four houses were eventually designed: three by Wright, and another one by another architect. But then the the scientists that went in together and bought that property uh, decided to keep all the rest of the property. So there's uh, fifty or so acres that are largely undeveloped. Uh, it's a very much uh, country within the city area. And the lights continuing to build some interesting houses. This, this is again another one of his small communities in upstate New York, um, the, the Risley House. But again, you see the relationship, and, and you're getting much more into that modern design that you're going to see follow on in a few years later as Holland Hills and the other mid-century modern communities start to really take off. And you can see that precursor aspect of this house. I designed this community, and initially, in addition to designing three houses in the community, he also had uh, sort of veto power over plans of other architects, at least for the, for the first few months or a couple of years. This is the uh, community that I've been in uh, uh, that reminds me the most of Holland Hills. There was great concern over keeping as much of the natural uh, contours of the land, the trees, the plants, and so forth in place. 
And then from here, we have some interesting influence of light on mid-century modern designers. Um, there's this case study, it's called the Case Study Architecture Magazine at, out in California, a challenged architects to develop affordable modern houses that could be built most anywhere. Um, most of them tended to be built in California. Um, one of the people that was built would built one of these houses as an example was Charles Ames with his wife Ray. And Ames is known for being an aficionado of right. Matter of fact, there's a story that he dropped out of architecture college when he was criticized for being too supportive of Wright's ideas and, and went into industrial design as, a, as an alternative. But clearly these case study houses um, are building off the openness of Wright, um, the effect of Mies van der Rohe and his effect on from Wright in building these really fascinating looking houses. There are 20 some, uh, almost all of them still exist and uh, they're very different but all of them very modern, uh, going with glass as we see here. This is perhaps the most iconic of the houses because there's a famous Jules Schulman picture taken at night that it took a couple of days to set up and it looks like the house is you know, hovering in the air with Los Angeles uh, skyline in the background. One of my favorite stories is, is Levittown. Um, in 1937, Wright was building one of his Usonian homes on Long Island. And the young architect named Alfred Levitt um, was fascinated by what was Wright doing. And he apparently spent the whole summer essentially spying on Wright and trying to understand what Wright had done. And when he and his brother took over their father's construction company and started um, planning some major developments after World War II, he took the concepts that Wright was doing of slab floor construction, radiant floor heating, carports, open space plans, dressing them up in more traditional facades, but clearly making them much more effective than they ever would have been if they hadn't taken these ideas that Wright had pioneered and young Alfred Levitt had, pop, had really glommed onto and really made it an interesting connection. You don't tend to think of something like the industrial housing that Levitt was doing with tens of thousands of houses associated with Wright, but clearly there was an influence that made them much more successful. Now, Levitt in particular, uh, there are all, uh, many, many developers around the country, but Levitt in particular shows an affinity uh, for Frank Lloyd Wright more than perhaps any other large scale developer. It wasn't only in New York that that happened. Um, our next slide is uh, for um, in Colorado, outside of Denver, Arapahoe Acres. Um, another developer um, wanted to have these modern designs, and he had read Wright's Natural House and hired architects that would build off of that. And there's a vibrant mid-century mid modern community in the Denver suburbs. Um, Again, the more you think about, the more you find out about it, the more you find out the precursors of so many of these places. There's an interesting tie with Wright and what he was doing. Of course, probably again, the, the next slide we have one of the major builders in the West Coast, mostly in San Francisco, a little bit in, in Southern California. You have Eichler. Well, Eichler was a developer, and for a while, he actually rented a, a white design house outside of San Francisco. He fell so in love with it that when the owner tried to kick him out, he had to be evicted. Um, but he then hired some local architects to develop these houses based on Wright's principle of openness, uh, bringing the outdoors in, um, Clearly, very modern houses, but clearly derivative of what the experience he had in the basin house in San Francisco, and both very successful. And as with Holland Hills, the price of these houses in the last couple of years have just skyrocketed as people really appreciate the connection to nature that you can have with this really organic sense that right, that was in these buildings. As you can see from. From this example, it is upscale from uh, Levittown by quite a bit, but still it wasn't, uh, it wasn't aimed at the very wealthy. And the design differences are significant among the Eichler houses when there's uh, probably somewhere between 11 and 12,000 in California. Uh, more of them in the, in the San Francisco Bay area, not necessarily in the city itself. 
but uh, also there are several thousand in the Southern California area. Some of them had uh, atriums with glass looking in to all sides of the atrium. Uh, some were more almost ranch style in terms of the plan, but very modern in terms of the detailing that they had. Uh, much better craftsmanship and cabinetry and appliances and so forth, but all contained with the idea of merging in with the land as opposed to sticking out from it. Again, going along with Wright's concept that you don't build a house on the land, you build it of the land and you incorporate it as part of that land. This is kind of a fun picture. Um, Maitre had worked for Wright in the early 20s and Wright had designed the Fallen Water House for Kaufman and Apparently, Wright was rather upset with um, Nature when he hired um, his former employee to build him a house in Palm Springs rather than hiring Wright himself to do this. Um, but again, you're clearly seeing the influence. Um, the number of people that were building mid-century modern homes um, in the Palm Springs area is significant. And a number of them, including Nature, um, Schiller, and uh, Red Wright Jr., um, were all you know, ex-workers and learned their craft from right and developed that and developed, went on, obviously went on to their own and incorporated their own ideas and how they were doing it. But again, the, the, te the central co concepts of connecting the house to the world and making it feel like it was part of that openness was really a, a, a absolutely intriguing part of what was going on. And maybe John could kind of step in here. This is um, the Twin Palms Estates is not really, you know, direct. we have no direct connection with Wright, but clearly they're part of that mid-century modern movement and made some really iconic houses, including some rather expensive ones like this one for, for Frank Sinatra. One of the things why we brought some of these Palm Springs homes in is because as a group, the Friends of Holland Hills, is also interested in connecting Holland Hills with other mid-century communities around around the country. So I, I think if if you're interested in it like we are, you know, please continue to, to be involved and and, um, and, sh and share knowledge. And that, that's what we're trying to do is, is pull these communities together because um, there really is a value in, in um, making these connections and in, um, in preserving what we have. Uh, I know just before we started this, I know um, Christine had found us some interesting things I would not heard about, about another community next to Arapaho Acres in um, Colorado that was set up as a co-op. Um, it was, again, somewhat similar to the Park Lawn, Park Lawn um, situation. Um, and I, th I can really see you guys hook hooking up with them and connecting with the interaction with the different really interesting mid-century modern communities that you have around as more and more of them become notified and, and recognized by the Park Service as, as historical and historically important documents. And I'm sure they would be, well, welcome any uh, interest from Holland Hills because they don't have any real formal protection uh, for intrusion into the community. They've been quite successful up to this point, uh, but there are no in, in statutes that actually protect them. A lot of that going around. Well, clearly, Holland Hills is a lot going around as, it, as they're working to getting a historical overlay district within the town, Fairfax County to give you more protection than this, the, the Homeowners Association will give you. So it'll be interesting to follow and see how that works out. It's an interesting discussion. It's, it's, a, it's a topic that's a very in the forefront of a lot of minds in our community at the moment is this historic overlay district community. But um, we don't want to get too deep into that in this, in this format. Again, you, you, this is kind of a fun picture of the, the butterfly roof. Now, one of the things I really like about this uh, overlay of the, uh, the, the house, the, the neighborhood itself in Holland Hills. The next slide, John. Um, yeah, um, I mean, to me, one of the real important concepts of right is the idea of organic architecture and how the houses become part of their nature. And I just love the fact that in Holland Hills, you've got all these houses that abut and can, you know, connect with each other but they share views. They they interlock. You know, you don't you don't allow fences, so the 
each of the lots seems significantly larger and more connected and more part of that natural environment than they ever would as if they were chopped up in little little parcels. And then you can see just from the street plan itself how much concern was given to incorporating the natural layout of the land, the natural topography in the final design. And one of the things that you, you hear a lot about Goodman and the importance of his work within Holland Hills, but you don't hear as much about Bernard Boyd, Boyd the, uh, the landscape architect that was doing a lot of this layout work for him. Um, and just really an important person in the history of Holland Hills and that development. The namesake of our Voight Park. <laughs> we also have a, a couple of photos of Holland Hills for those of you who are not uh, local to the community. Um, this is just a couple of the houses in the neighborhood. These are all, are all Goodman houses. These are all homes in Holland Hills for the most part. There's a few that are not original Goodmans. Uh, and I, if, if, if Peter and Bill, if, if, you know, I think there are, when you, when you look at sort of the, the structure and the glass, the openness, the connection to the exterior, to nature, um, the setting, you know, the siting of Holland Hills, all the homes, even though they're not, you know, just uh, parallel to the street, they're all rotated um, to respect the, the topography and the neighboring homes. You know, a lot, a lot of about what Wright was doing in terms of, um, engaging with, with nature and... Uh, yeah. Exactly, he planned some uh, war housing that uh, was, was kiboshed by a local wondering why an architect in Wisconsin was doing something in Massachusetts. But each of those houses would have been rotated 45 degrees from, uh, from its neighbors and fit in. That, they couldn't do much with topography. It was for war workers, so they needed it immediately. But even in something like that, he was taking into consideration the neighboring houses. Yeah, and, and much like Wright, who appreciated actually difficult lots and difficult, difficult locations to build his houses, as my understanding is Highland Hills was available to build because it was a regular land, and a lot of developers didn't want to go into it because they couldn't make simple wood patterns. And you know, Davenport understood that he could make some really interesting process, um, and make some really interesting housing if he did that properly, if he connected those houses, and it was much, much better product. Then just a, you know, a couple, you know, a couple hundred yards away, there's all of a sudden you get into a good pattern that's near Holland Hills, and you can see how much better this is. Okay, uh, we're at the end of our slides. Um, what I want to do is I'm gonna I'm gonna stop sharing the slides, and I'm gonna see if I can open up the chat and open up to some questions. It's not going to be easy. We are over a hundred at the moment. Let me see what I can do here to get. Christine could get Bill and Peter back up on the middle of the screen, possibly. I, I just so love the idea that I see Holland Hills as just the, the perfect follow-on to what Wright was doing with his, his organic architecture, and it just so fits with it so nice, nicely. It's just kind of fun to, to have that connection and link it together. And so how he was able to run for it and make it houses for a lot more people than Wright was ever able to do. Now, as I said, the closest he came was Usonia, and he only designed three houses there. There are only about 50 lots altogether in Usonia. So that is the one of all of Wright's projects that reminds me the most of Holland Hills. So Holland Hills is a you know, a stunning example of what can be done with Wright's principles and other principles of other modern architects to blend in to the environment in a very uh, positive way. Seems like most of the chat is about uh, Peter's audio. <laughs> I apologize for that. If anybody wants to uh, to to, re to ask a question, we are monitoring the chat now. Um, we are, have been monitoring the chat all along. So if you um, have a question for for Peter or Bill, please feel free to uh, enter the chat, and uh, I will ask the question so that they can answer for the group. <laughs> 
So how many, how, what, 450 houses in Holland Hills, I believe? Holland Hills is about, I think it's 485, I think is the number. That, there's some debate on how many are Goodman and how many aren't, um, but it's it's in the high 400s. Yeah. And, you know, it's some interesting additional things that, you know, kind of you wouldn't even think about. You've got that Alcoa house that, that Goodman designed that's within Holland Hills. It's a little more traditional ranch style um, that the you know, Alcoa Lunar Company um, got Davenport to build. And okay, here, uh, getting a couple questions now. One, um, is there any evidence that Goodman intentionally furthered the narrative that Wright envisioned with Usonia? I don't, I'm not a, I'm not aware of any direct knowledge of anything directly linking Goodman to to Wright. Clearly, Wright was you know in the architectural um, publications and was the architectural world of U.S. was aware of what he was doing. But I'm not aware of Goodman having any direct connection. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's no, that's that, also my view. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting that Goodman graduated from the Illinois Institute of Technology, um, where after Goodman um, graduated, Mies van der Rohe took over the, um, as, as the um, director of the, the institute. Yeah, I, one of the, this is a question, this ties right into a question, so maybe you can expand on that a little bit. Uh, sort of a question statement. Many of the Holland Hills houses seem to have a strong connections to Mies van der Rohe, Walter Gropius, and particularly Marcel Brewer. Is this a connection that you explored or seen in the past? Well, that's part. That's part of the reason that we were really bringing in the Bauhaus people in the very beginning, and the influence that Wright was having on the Bauhaus, and um, how important it was, and then linking that to the international exhibit from MoMA. Um, that's really the tie. Is that you can see them feeding off of what Wright was doing and you know, going the wrong way with it, but clearly being influenced by what Wright was producing, and then you know Mies and. Um, Mies and Wright had an interesting relationship because Wright had a pretty interesting relationship with pretty much everybody. Um, yes. If you, all, if you all very vocal. Yes, and, yes. Uh, Nitra did some interesting houses in California that I think are even more clearly related to, uh, to Wright's uh, work. Of course, Wright tended to object to that because he thought ideas were being stolen by Nitra and Schindler and others. And somebody chimed in at 483 houses. I was, maybe I was too off. I'm sure that's a, a, a topic of debate. Yes. Um, I got another uh, good question. Um, are there any 21st century architects that are doing similar things that discuss rotation of homes and aligning with topography? Um, uh, yes. There's a, there's a whole series of houses in this area that are um, acorn houses that are clearly very modern that seem to be very much connected with the land and have a lot of that openness that you feel in the mid-century modern. Um, I'm not sure if they're, you know, I'm not sure where they are right or they're still building, but I know a couple of years ago there were a number of those, especially out in the Maryland area, up near, near um, Annapolis. Uh, there's a couple of questions about um, design review, but we, we can't get into that in, in this format. Uh, let me see what else we have here. Um, it is said that Wright's homes were always beautiful, but suffered from certain engineering challenges <laughs> as time went on. Uh, how about Holland Hills homes? You guys can talk a little bit about anything. You know about that, but I can certainly chime in on some of the engineering challenges that uh, have evolved over the years in Holland Hills. Well, one of the things I remember, I remember looking at the houses in Holland Hills with the idea that I wanted to move there in the 80s. And at that point, pretty much most of the houses still had single pane glass. And I think pretty much everybody's now retrofitted them with insulated glass. And that's clearly something that you know has evolved over time. And you know, I think that was an engineering challenge. Of course, the same issue came with Wright. Apparently, there was a house in Wisconsin, in Wyoming, that he was he was getting he was building, and the folks says, "What about these new third pane windows? They're supposed to be pretty good for insulation." And Wright says, "Oh, you don't need that. We we don't have to have any problem with that." Of course, as soon as Wright left the room, his assistant um, Peters came back. We'll get you third pane windows. A lot has been said about the radiant heating 
And uh, I think the general opinion is that it didn't work. But I've been in some houses that still had the original radiant heat, which was working fine, and the people loved it. But I think the overall opinion, not just of experts, but of people who lived in a right house, would agree that radiant heating could have some real problems. Well, the, te the technology was a problem. I mean, there's, there's a house by Overland, Ohio, where they, they joked with the public, but only in the summer, because the radiant floor heating failed, and they brought out a piece of the pipe that they had took a look at, and it looked like a colander. I mean, it had so rotted out. And there's a number of white houses, um, including the um, the Jacobs House and the Zimmerman House in um, in New Hampshire, where they've actually jackhammered the floor uh, to dig up the foundation to lay new PEX plastic, where the concept was good, but the installation and the materials they used in the engineering, um, they were a little bit ahead of their time. Yeah, that's the thermal pane windows in, in Holland Hills. Yeah, I think that's it's. There's a real connection there. I mean, that could be the connection between <laughs> Frank Lloyd Wright's homes and uh, a lot of modern homes built back then. You know, they were pushing design and they were pushing technology, and, and these big panes of glass were, were single pane, and and they suffered the same problems that we have here, except in in California or in Palm Springs, it's not as big of an issue because it doesn't often. You, know, you don't spend a winter hovering, you know, in the 30s uh, like we do here for a large portion of the winter time. Um, and at that time too, fuel was cheaper. So you, could, you know, sometimes the mindset was just turn up the heat and, and let it go. But uh, you know, structurally they were pushing the limits um, with uh, the, the window, the windows with wood framing, and uh, certainly with um, uh, you know with the radiant floor heating. But radiant floor heating goes back, you know, millennia. You know, the Romans were. Heating the floor, and I think there's a real radiant floor heating has come a long way. Um, but you know they were pushing the boundaries then. Holland Hills had some homes with radiant floor heating, um, and some of them actually still work. You know, some of them have been replaced over the years. But you know, now technology is involved that you really can have um, a, a very high tech um, radiant floor that does a really good job of heating your home and, and can actually compensate for these windows because it's tough when you have just the the um, HVA systems that, you know, blow air through a, a register. You don't get that sort of uh, uniform heat that can help compensate for floor-to-ceiling glass. I think that's one of the things that characterizes Wright's architecture is his quest to bring light inside, to blur the boundary between the inside and the, the yard outside to make it sort of a unified whole. And especially he did that with these window treatments. Just got a great question. How did the World War II planned communities in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the SOM design neighborhood near the Martin Aircraft Factory in north of Baltimore, or Kensington Gardens outside of Pittsburgh fit into this type of context? One of the things I've played with is the idea of Greenbelt. There were like, Three or four of these Greenbelt communities, they're really pre-World War II, but they were precursors to these World War II communities. And, you know, the government was um, bringing people in, making whole new towns out of this. And in Greenbelt, um, after they had all these um, apartments and townhouses they were building, a number of the people were interested in building a, you know, some single-family homes. And they hired one of Wright's apprentices to design those houses prior to World War II. So there's an interesting connection with that. And obviously, you know, they're all feeding off of this idea of playing communities that Wright was playing with in the 20s and 30s with, with Broadacre City. Now, the concept of the, the you know, Oak Ridge, for instance, is a, was a huge community. Uh, and uh, there were a variety of homes some were like duplexes and quadruplexes and so forth. There were single family homes of varying sizes. Uh, and there was some concern there for open space, but it was being built so very quickly that there wasn't the concern, for instance, of the green cities, green belt cities of the 1930s. Unfortunately, there were only a couple that were actually built. And I think the most successful is actually the one in the Washington DC area. Another, another question, um, 
Was Goodman's notion of integrating his homes into the landscape unique to his style, or was this something that he would have discussed with his contemporaries? Hmm. Ooh, I don't really I think have a response on that. I think he probably was his very deeply held beliefs, but how much he would have shared them. Do you have an idea, Peter? Not directly, but I mean, yeah, these folks are all talking to each other. I mean, they all lived off each other's experience. So, I mean, I don't, none of them were insolent. They were all very communal in, in talking about what they're doing, why they were doing it. So I would expect that to have happened. Uh, a couple uh, comments just to note. Um, someone adds that also in the NCR is Homes Run Acres which is a bit more modest than Holland Hills, but still fun to see. It's a, a the Hops Run Acres was uh, yeah. built at approximately the same time, but there were three separate phases to it. In the last phase, they weren't huge homes, but they were rather significantly larger than in the first phase, in particular the first phase, looking somewhat like the Levittown modern ones, uh, but were you know quite small. And at least in some instances, if there was a second story, it was almost as though it had been designed for like a, uh, you know, parents to come after they retire or something. There was no direct stairway from the upper floor to the lower floor. Uh, there is concern there also for uh, some community spaces. Uh, the houses are pretty well set back in many cases but the lots are smaller. There's not as much concern because there wasn't simply the ability with the cost involved and the cost they wanted for the end result to have the landscaping that Holland Hills has. Yeah, and actually, you know, in Bill and I's history, a couple of years ago, we put together a program for the Smithsonian Associates where we took people to Pope Leahy, then we took them to Holland Hills, and then we took them to Homes Run. And Homes Run is interesting in that it's, kind of a not quite as ambitious of architectural design. Goodman clearly had significantly more ambition and um, trying to do something very, very unique. But both were trying to give people interesting affordable homes. Um, and I, I have no sense of what the history of um, you know segregation or um, how that was working. Um, I would expect that since we were in Virginia, um, it was not particularly good. Um, the history of that. I know um, Levitt was practicing uh, segregated housing, um, and it, it was just that was the way the world was. It wasn't good, but that's how it happened. Um, so I would I would not expect to see a lot of that type of, of you know healthy integration that would that should have happened earlier. Um, that is obviously starting to happen now. Another. Um good bit of information for those of you, and I want to add this, for those of you that aren't from the community or might be in town next weekend for the Home and Garden Tour, um, Goodman was fairly prolific um, local to, in Virginia, especially around the Alexandria area. So he, but he also designed homes in Reston, Rock Creek Woods, River Park uh, Co-op in Southwest DC. And he actually was the architect for, um, I think it's Terminal D uh, at National Airport, the old terminal. Um, which if you're looking at the airport, it's on the far right. Um, he was fairly prolific. I also think he has two apartment buildings downtown that are still standing. Um, someone could chime in and correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe he also he did some buildings in D.C., some larger buildings. He also has his own home in Alexandria that yes. he took an old house and remodeled it. Did some really interesting stuff with adding some very modern aspects to that house. I, I agree, and I have... I. I just want to note this one bit of information that that was Goodman doing what many architects do. And he had a, he got himself an older house and he put on a modern addition. Um, yeah. And so I, I think, you know, even Goodman thought there was room for um, straying from the formula, you know, doing something different, you know, good architecture is good architecture. Uh, it doesn't have to be a cookie cutter, you know, because if, if you were bound by the style, then Goodman would have had to put on, you know, a, a Virginia style addition to the, to the Alexandria home he bought, you know, but, uh, you know, he kept the main home and then he, he added on his style of, of addition to it. I, I think that says a lot about what he thought was right. And so we, there's a lot of discussion in the community about, you know, what Goodman would have thought. And I think that house is a really good example of, you know, 
how he perceived what's the right thing to do, you know, mixing styles. Yeah, and then talk about the history of you know, architecture and you know, how things were developed. Um, when the popes took the plans for their house to the bank in 1939 to see if they could get a mortgage, the banks wouldn't touch it because it was not in that colonial style. In those days, banks held their own notes so that if they had a foreclose on it, they were concerned that they would never sell it. Um, they were obviously proved wrong because the popes sold the house six years after they bought it for um, over double what they paid for it. Um, so the, it's an interesting history about you know how all that happens and how things develop and don't develop. I'm not sure if Pete, if Peter, you're reading the chat because you seem to have responded maybe to one of these chats, but it's only noted that the Dresden includes Goodman Design townhomes that were deliber deliberately sought to integrate the community. Ah, excellent. I, I was not aware of that. Um, but then interesting train of thought there. Yes. When Goodman homes were built, were they desirable because of the architecture? or because of the cost? Oh, that's something you and Christine can probably answer better than we can. I can, I, it, I think it was more about the architecture and, and the community, um, from my knowledge of, how, of the time. These were not inexpensive homes. These were homes, a lot of professionals were buying these homes. Um, it wasn't affordable housing, but they weren't, um, over the top, it was professional folks, but you know these weren't um, now what we would call like million dollar mansions or something. But they were not. Um, this was not affordable housing, so it was sort of somewhere in between. And he was definitely targeting a unique uh, sort of community, people that could appreciate this because it wasn't the standard housing. You know, this this was this was unique in 1950s also. Um, you know, because people were doing a lot of your uh, colonial brick typical Virginia construction at the time. And, and Goodman and Davenport um, coming in here and doing this was, was as unique then as it, as it is now. Um, and, that, and they got a lot of unique people as we can uh, attest to the, those that are still here from, from the early crowd um, to the broad spectrum of people that have lived here over the many decades Holland Hills has been here. There's some, there, there was, is, and will continue to be very interesting people in Holland Hills. And I, I think that's because of the architecture. And it's certainly not because it's affordable anymore. That's for sure. Actually, I think this is really a, a, a really tight connection with the Usonian homes. I mean, those 24 houses that were built before World War II, all the clients were college graduates. In the day when maybe 5% of the people were college graduates. They were going to him because they were interested in the pr principles that he was playing with. And I think that's exactly what's happened in Holland Hills. I mean, you look at, as you said, the community, the people that are there, these are educated people that are going because they're interested in the ideas and what's being said about them. And it's obvious from the way the, the, the grounds are all kept and the houses are kept that people really care about, you know, their environment. And uh, they care about the appearance of the, of the community. And that's obvious. I'm not sure. I have a good question here, but I don't know if Bill and Peter are the right uh, folks to answer it. But it says, uh, we haven't discussed Goodman's work for National Homes, which resulted in thousands of his designs being built. Um, could you comment on how those designs were in part a result of Goodman's work in Holland Hills? I think I know a little bit about this, but I'll let Peter and Bill. I, I really don't know. I've heard about it, but I, I've never looked into it. I can't add anything to that. Interesting topic. Um, I only know a little bit about it. Um, Goodman, I believe, sold some designs to a national uh, housing manufacturer. And I'm not going to go into detail because I don't want to misspeak, but I, I don't want to let the question go completely unanswered. Um, and that, that manufacturer um, used those designs to sell kit homes. There, I believe there are two in the neighborhood um, that are, so they're Goodman-esque, they're very Goodman-esque homes, but they're not. Holland Hills, Goodman Homes. Um, but Goodman's design was used to create these um, sort of kits that you could buy to build these homes. And if I'm, I'm incorrect, please answer on the chat. <laughs> um, oh, somebody chimed in, says their home was built in 1953 and cost about $17,000. Um, 
interesting fact. I'm, it'd be interesting to know what all these homes went for um, in 1953. Uh, somebody makes a comment about furniture. Um, we did have um, the notion of bringing furniture into this mid-century discussion. Wright is also known for making a lot of furniture. Um, Wright designed um, a lot of built-ins, a lot of um, furniture pieces that they had custom made for his designs. He was very um, insistent that his designs were uh, sort of a complete package. Um, if you go to Falling Water, you'll see a lot of the pieces, the stools, the couches, if they're not built in, if they're freestanding, they're of his design. Um, we're going to use that as another um, future session um, for these ed for this educational series where we're going to talk about um, modern furniture of all sorts. We'll certainly touch on right, but uh, keep your ears posted to our um, our social media and you'll know that when that event is coming. I haven't seen any new question. Does anybody else have a question? If you have it, I'll ask it. No? If there are no more questions, we are right at our hour. Oh, wait, oops, oh, somebody started typing, hang on. Uh, somebody's noting that, um, forgive me if I butcher the name, Goodman also designed a few homes in, uh, I think it's Moyon Reserve across the Potomac from Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. I've heard that pronounced several different ways. But Goodman was very prolific in the area. He, was, he was, did a lot of work. Uh, here we go. Somebody did chime chime in. Thank you. National Homes was a national prefabricated home company. Goodwin was their modern architect in the mid 1950s, featured in their ads. They introduced new models every year, like car manufacturers. Oh. There is a National Homes neighborhood in Richmond and another in Woodbridge. Thank you very much, caller. <laughs> yes. Uh, Nothing new has come up since that question. I just want to give a quick plug for our home and garden tour, Holland Hills Home and Garden Tour, next weekend. Um, uh, if if you're here and on here, I imagine you've already bought tickets. Um, I think we, I probably shouldn't have plugged it though, because I think we sold out. Yeah, um, sold out. And I hope most people are coming. If you're, if you're on this call, hopefully you're coming because this is meant to be part of that tour and part of the welcoming you all to Holland Hills. Um, it's there also is a lot of stuff happening on social media for Holland Hills. We're really trying to to reach out and, um, and increase awareness of our community um, locally and throughout the country. And the Friends of Holland Hills is hoping to do whatever we can to contribute to that. So if you're in town next weekend for the tour, we'll have a table at the uh, at the ticket registration, which happens at the uh, middle school here at um, uh, Holland Meadows Middle School, where you can pick up your tickets and stop by and, and say hello. Um, and with that, I want to give a, a huge thanks to Peter Christensen and Bill Keen for uh, giving up part of their Sunday afternoon to, to share their wealth of knowledge about Frank Lloyd Wright with all of us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you all. And, and keep your eye out for more of our educational series in the future. Thank you all for coming.